So, earlier this week, dear viewers, I was invited to the British Museum. And why was I invited to the British Museum, you might ask? No, I'm not old enough to be an exhibit just yet. I was, in fact, invited to have a look at their new temporary exhibition, special exhibition, on the Roman legions. Now, you might be thinking, hang on, track. We know you. The Roman legions are land-based rather famously. You're a naval historian. What are you doing looking at Roman legions? Well, for one thing, it's a very interesting museum. In fact, it's probably the single largest collection of existing remaining Roman arms and armour that you're likely to ever see. So if you're interested in the Romans generally, just that's a good enough reason to go and see it. But obviously the legionaries did fight at sea and... The legionary in particular that the museum follows, because they have records of his service, actually did spend a fair amount of time in the Roman marines, as opposed to the land-based legions, even if he didn't necessarily always like it. And so there is a definite maritime connection, which is quite interesting, actually, as well as some actual ship artefacts. So, shall we have a quick dive in and see what we can find that is related to the sea and ships in a museum about the Roman legions. Well, welcome to the British Museum's mu exhibit on the Roman legion. We're uh, over here with our good friend Augustus, he of the very piercing eyes and the disapproving look, and we're going to have a look at some Roman soldiers, particularly, of course, with some maritime focus. So let's see what we can find in here where we have Roman soldiers who might have some kind of riverine or maritime connection. Well, this fine folk person here is Quintus Petilius Secundus, and he's a Roman legionary, but interestingly, he's from the Rhine frontier region. So although he's a legionary, we know that many of the legions patrolled the Rhine frontier on the River Rhine, surprisingly enough, in a series of small boats, some of which we've actually found and some of which have been reconstructed by modern archeologists. So whilst we don't have any direct evidence that this particular soldier was on a boat on the Rhine, the fact that he served in that area makes it relatively likely that either he did or he certainly knew people who did patrol up and down in these small craft, which in many cases actually look like miniaturized versions of the triremes and other craft the Romans used on the Mediterranean. Now, those of you who are fans of Roman history might recognize these documents. I mean, admittedly, it's a little bit of a flat perspective, but that's the best I can do as retirement diplomas, i.e. these are things that were given to Roman soldiers when they reached their 25 year of military service. And so they can retire, and if you're an auxiliary, that means you get Roman citizenship. If you're a legionary, that means you get 10 years pay, which is a nice amount of change. But interestingly, this is the earliest known example uh, granted by the Roman Emperor Claudius to one Spartacus Dipskirtus a Thracian, so he is getting his citizenship, so he's an auxiliary, and again this has a naval connection because he served as a marine in Mycenaeum, or Mycenaeum possibly, which is in the Bay of Naples over in Italy, and considering that he was a Thracian from southeast Europe, so more Black Sea region, he was a fair distance from home for the majority of his service. Now some things have a very long tradition going behind them and this is one of them so if you've seen USS Constitution, HMS Victory, any of the other preserved wooden warships of various periods in various countries or perhaps photos of something like say the bow of USS Olympia you'll know that ships figureheads were very much in vogue for a huge huge amount of time in fact you know really only going out of fashion in the 20th century for warships. This is an example of a Roman period figurehead. So it's obviously uh, <laughs> a little bit old and would have been on the bow of a trireme or quinquereme or something like that, maybe even a bireme, not sure exactly, but it was obviously fished off of the seabed and you have your little figurehead. It's obviously a lot smaller than the big wooden carvings you'll see on something like Victory or Warrior, but then again, a trireme is considerably smaller than Victory or Warrior as well. And what you might not be able to see in full detail in the video picture, oh, just over here, but hopefully I'll be overlaying a close-up, is a little bit of pottery which has a very, 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 very detailed, um, not engraving really, more of a, a sculpture almost, of a Roman warship complete with ram and troops aboard it. 
And you may have seen various iterations of photographs of this artifact in various publications and so forth, but it is really small. We're talking what, no more than three, four inches on a side, which is why it looks so tiny in this. And the amount of detail on it is absolutely incredible. So they've paired this up as part of a, a small section in the second part uh, of the exhibit because it's divided up into various blocks. And this exhibit case is obviously dealing with particularly maritime stuff. And for those of you who are interested, this particular figurehead shows the Roman goddess Minerva, and it is supposed to have come from a ship that was scrapped in the aftermath of the Battle of Actium. So this isn't just a random Roman figurehead, as unique as that would still be. This particular figurehead was actually present, apparently, at that great battle that decided the fate of whether the Roman Republic was going to become the Roman Empire. Now this chap, who you can see here in this rather lovely painting, which is of course period, is called Appian. And that's A-P-I-O-N, or maybe Appion, I guess, at that point. It's not the same guy that Josephus wrote a whole polemic against, don't worry about that. He is another Roman auxiliary. And the letter to the left that you can see, whilst he was not a Marine, he does have a small maritime connection because that letter on the left, he's complaining about his posting, or more accurately, the journey to his posting because the legionaries didn't, or and auxiliaries in this case, didn't have to walk everywhere. In this case, he was sent to his new posting by ship. But it turns out the Mediterranean was not particularly kind to him on this occasion. And most of the letter is essentially saying, yeah, don't travel by ship, it's really nasty. We got tossed and turned and thrown about all over the place. And now we're on terra firma, so happy days. And <laughs> presumably a long period recovering from the seasickness. Now, what we have here, and I can't show you directly for reasons of, you know, respect and sensitivity, is actually the remains of a Roman soldier. The reason we're looking at this particular area is because it's fairly likely that he was a Roman Marine, particularly from Herculaneum. So this is actually one of the victims of the famous Mount Vesuvius eruption that most people obviously know took out Pompeii, but also took out Herculaneum. So. He is a Marine, one of the soldiers who was probably trying to help people evacuate. From, you know, we know from the writings of Pliny the Younger that Pliny the Elder took a force of ships across the bay to try and rescue people. And uh, well, that's where Pliny the Elder met his end, uh, which was not particularly brilliant for him, but some people were rescued. And who knows, maybe this particular chap helped in that rescue attempt, but just wasn't able to, for whatever reason to make it to a ship. Overlaying the picture hopefully should be some of the pictures from this bit just here where we have his equipment. Now, of course, it was peacetime in the middle of Italy. They weren't expecting violence, so he wasn't wearing any armor when he died, but he was wearing a full range of regular military equipment. So just looking here, you've got a gladius, you've got a fairly large dagger, um, almost a short sword, and you've got what looks like a pair of smaller actual daggers or knives and possibly what looks like some kind of entrenching tool but you can make it out a bit better in the clear pictures which will again hopefully be going up on the screen at the moment. Marine duty doesn't seem to have been particularly popular because you didn't get paid as well as the full legionaries for the most part unless it was a legion assigned to ships obviously but you had the extra hazards of, you know, the ship might sink under you if you get caught in a storm. And when the ship was in port, you had to do all the regular duties that would be expected of a Roman soldier. So, you know, road building for the Marines, particularly guarding the grain shipments and other things in port. And considering the number of fires and other disasters that tended to occur in ports, you were also kind of the quick response unit for those kinds of things, which obviously uh, didn't do this particular chap at much good. But it was regular pay and you could transfer into or out of the Marines if you had the right number of connections or you made the right friends, which I suppose if there's plenty of valuable stuff to guard, people to save at sea and natural disasters to mitigate on land, you'd probably make a fair friend sooner or later if you had a fairly interesting life as a Marine and you could possibly use that to better your station. One of the most important jobs for the Roman Marines was the guarding of the grain supply. Rome could not feed itself, 
as a city, it needed to import large amounts of grain, which could then be used to make bread, which of course would allow you to have bread and circuses. And all of that came from mostly, for the large part of the Roman imperial period, Egypt. So you had grain ships coming up from Alexandria and either skirting along the coast of North Africa and then up via Sicily to Italy and then Rome, or occasionally via Crete and Cyprus, depending on how the winds went. And this is some additional examples of that. So on the left here, there's a small coin. Again, you know, larger picture being overlaid at the moment. And that shows you some of the grain ships coming in. They were incredibly important. And for those of you who are students of the New Testament, uh, the, uh, well, saint, apostle, whatever you want to call him, Paul, when he was on his way to Rome, when he was shipwrecked at Malta, was almost certainly on a Roman grain ship of some description. The size, the direction of travel, and the season all seem to correspond to a large Roman trade vessel, most likely a grain ship, that was passing by and picked him up. And obviously in that particular case was taking a route, rather than going along the coast of North Africa, up via Roman-controlled Judea and then over via Crete and Cyprus, and they, well, obviously overshot a little bit and ended up smashing into Malta. Now here we have the only surviving example of a Roman scutum, literally the only one. You think how many hundreds of thousands of these things must have been manufactured? This is the only one left. Now, obviously this is an infantry scutum. This is not, unfortunately, a marine scutum. However, since it's the only one, bears looking at because it gives you an idea of what these things would have been like, what equipment the Romans would have used. Now, of course, scutum, like all shields, are tailored to a certain degree to the size of their wearer. So, I mean, <laughs> okay, it's elevated a little bit off the ground, but you can immediately tell that for a full body covering, the way that scooter are depicted on columns and reliefs and so forth and paintings and mosaics, for someone like me holding that, if I drop that down by what, maybe a foot, that's not gonna necessarily entirely cover me. And especially if I was wearing armor, it's not wide enough either. It may have curled a little bit in the amount of time it's spent in the intervening times, obviously, since it was used. But still, this, this scutum is probably just a fraction too small to someone of my height, which perhaps indicates that it was used by a soldier who was a bit smaller than me. Or perhaps, you know, maybe there's something with the artist reliefs, I don't know. You know, experts in scutum can probably comment below. But if I was going to be a Roman legionary or a Roman marine, and I was issued a scutum, I would probably want something that's maybe three, four inches larger all around. But to be fair, it, it's still fairly protective. You know, it's bigger than a medieval heater shield, for example. So you can still make fairly decent use of it. And it's very nicely decorated, of course. Although in the classical manner of many artists over time, <laughs> this guy's definitely never seen a lion in person. I don't know about you, but I've never seen this many gladii and original Roman helmets, obviously, and original gladii all in one place. And there's more that way, there's more that way. Um, swords, not in particularly brilliant shape, but you know that's to be expected for something iron that's been sitting around in the ground for presumably the better part of two millennia. The interesting thing is that actually in this exhibit, they largely follow the career of a particular legionary called Terentianus. I think that's how it's pronounced anyway. And he actually spent some time in the Marines before transferring ashore to become a legionary. But one of the interesting letters he wrote home was actually asking for equipment to be sent to him because you did have some standard issue equipment, but not all of it. So you would or could or might have to buy additional equipment if you wanted to stay safe. And one of the things he actually writes back asking for is a grappling hook. So we know that that letter is from his time in the Marines. Uh, presumably either the ship he was assigned to didn't have them or yeah, didn't have enough of them for his liking and he really wanted to be able to reel in uh, an enemy ship that they were alongside. Fortunately for him, of course, he knew that his family already had some legionary equipment over from previous service, so he could write home and say, yeah, you know, Dad, I would really, really like you to send me a grappling hook so that I can do my job properly, albeit in some more formal prosaic language. 
So here is one of the many depictions they actually have of Tarantianus, and uh, they have a translated portion of one of his letters from a period that he spent at sea serving as a marine. It says that uh, both Calibel and Dipistus have enlisted in the Augustan fleet of Alexandria. So that would have been one of the main grain protection fleets and anti-piracy fleets, obviously. He then goes on, no one has reckoned up the chances of their lives because, well, yeah, as I said, being a marine did have the extra risk of drowning. I went by boat, and with their help I enlisted in the fleet, lest I seem to you to wander like a fugitive, lured on by a bitter hope. No father that I am now being sent off to Syria I'm about, and am about to leave with a detachment. So Tarantiana is following his friends into the Navy. Yeah, who's heard that story before? Now this section is mostly concerned obviously with the land-based side of the Roman army. However, there are a few cues that we can use to relate to the marine side as well. So over here on my left, your right, there's the remnants of a quiver for an archer's uh, arrows. Now obviously missile fire was quite important at sea, so marines would have had those, or some of them at least. The other thing you might see at the back is a reconstruction of a Roman ballista. Now a number of Roman ships, particularly the heavier ones like Hepteres and so forth, would carry one or more ballista. These are not like cannon in the Age of Sail where you would try and put a hole in the enemy ship to sink it, even though most Roman ships are relatively small compared to classic Age of Sail vessels. But they are anti-personnel and at the ranges they'd be fighting at relatively accurate. So you could fire bolts, maybe try and take out the steersman, the guy who's on the steering oars. You could try and take out some of their marines because there are relatively few fully armoured people aboard. You could use some forms of ballista, could fire essentially a catapult version of grape shot, a scattering of projectiles which could injure or kill multiple people. And if you were really clever, you might fire something like a pot of snakes or a casket of incendiaries, both of which we know various people did use in naval battles. And further over to my right, your left, possibly slightly out of shot, are the remains of some actual original ballista parts. Now, they've all obviously quite heavily rusted. You're not going to put those together and make a ballista out of them. But the reconstruction offers you an idea of at least the size of one type of Roman ballista, which is of course a torsion engine. Now, not strictly maritime, but who doesn't like a good dog? This is a statue of a Molossian hound, something which I kind of think to myself, you know, maybe I'd kind of like to have these back because they'd be really cool as pets, but also frankly quite terrifying. I mean, it might not look quite so large because I'm bending down in front of the camera about three feet away. This thing's a statue is about another six feet away. Normally, if you come to the British Museum before, this is one of a pair that usually lives up in the ancient Greek section, uh, talking about Alexander the Great. But these are essentially war dogs of the period. The Molossian Hound doesn't seem to exist anymore, but they're absolutely massive. So, I mean, we're talking a dog, I mean, you can see if I stand up. Okay, it's on a plinth, but this thing is probably even sitting and it's probably close to life size. That's like four, four and a half foot, maybe, maybe pushing just over four and a half foot high. And now <laughs> as the owner of a fairly large deer hound, which is one of the larger breeds of dog, if I had Abel Seaman Floppy here, he would probably come up to the uh, lower portion of the muzzle of this Molossian hound. And well, he's built for speed, poor old Floppy. This thing is built for war. It's chunky. I mean, you can see they've even put ripped cords of muscles on this guy. So yeah, good doggies. And um, Marines, but they would have shipboard animals to probably help clean out the vermin. Having a Molossian hound probably would be a bit of overkill because um, yeah, I don't think this guy's hunting something as small as a rat. And for those of you who have kids, there is actually a tie-in with Horrible Histories, and this is one of the last bits right at the end. You can see if you would have survived as an auxiliary or as a legionary. And, well, you can see here that that went fairly well for me as an auxiliary, because apparently there's about 50-50 chance of survival. Not so much as a legionary. Try again. Nope. Try as an auxiliary. So apparently auxiliary drac would have survived, based on sample size of four, and a legionary drac, not so much. Funnily enough, Given that it's a museum about the legions, the very first item, which is the first one we actually looked at, that you'll see as you come into the museum, that Roman soldier who served on the Rhine probably has some kind of at least Riverine correct connection. And this is the very last object you'll see leaving 
the this exhibit in the museum. And this also has a maritime connection, in fact, a very specific one, because this is the retirement certificate from uh, AD 71 of Marcus Cyrus, who is now a citizen of Rome. He served 26 years as a Marine. He has an honorable discharge. He's been granted it by the Emperor Vespasian. And he was originally from a region that was known at the time as the Decapolis, i.e. just east of the Jordan River. He spent most of his service as a Marine in Messenium in Italy. And so you've heard that particular place mentioned earlier in this video. And then he retired to a lovely, calm, picturesque, idyllic um, Pompeii. Yeah, well, uh, that's how we still have his certificate. Of course, if you were a citizen already, so you enlisted in the legions instead of the auxiliaries, or auxilia, I suppose, at the time, then you would be granted a big pot of money. And here, quite literally, is a big pot of money. This is your retirement purse if you are a legionary. It's all very shiny. Let's just hope the uh, legionary in question doesn't come looking for compound interest on this lot. So that's the maritime stuff. Of course, you can go look at it in a lot more detail. And there is a ton of other stuff to see as well, as you would imagine. So Legion, Life in the Roman Army, is open at the British Museum from the 1st of February, which is the day before this video goes up, all through to the 23rd of June, 2024. Entrance to the General British Museum is, of course, free. But as a special exhibit, there is an additional ticket that you will need to book on their website. And you can see things like small brooches with absolutely insane levels of detail. A series of rather funny looking bronze helmets in the shape of various people whose faces were not the ones depicted on the front of the helmet itself. A suit of armour made out of the hide of a crocodile. Although I question its effectiveness in battle because quite clearly it didn't do the crocodile much good. A rather large and impressive suit of scale armour for horses actual Roman armour that was worn by a legionary who died in the Teutoburg Forest Massacre and was then buried in his armour. And a Roman emperor who looks like you really should have met him down the pub rather than in, in an imperial throne room. So, all of that and more over at the British Museum. Thanks again once again for inviting me and hope you've enjoyed this video.